Hello, welcome. Um, welcome to an event about events. Um, we are all journalists for the most part here, um, and on the panel, I'll introduce it. Um, we, we represent different flavors of journalism and, and legacy and digital media, but what unifies us all is that we're all um, producing some kind of event or event strategy. Um, and increasingly, even though news media are still in the business of producing news for the most part, um, one of the big themes at this conference this year that struck me has been diversification and how more and more news media and publishers are beginning to think about other ways to produce content. Um, that means different formats, uh, and that means different also strategies of communicating the news and reaching audiences. And increasingly, events are part of this strategy. Um, and this is an event about journalism, but the kind of events we'll talk about isn't so much events about journalism as it is um, journalism as events, or actually a new format of journalism, which could be events. It's a long way of saying that um, you've probably all been to, if you live in New York, you've been to a New York Times or a New Yorker event or a Vox or a Quartz event. If you live in France, you may have been to a Le Monde or a Liberation event. Um, and you may have very well been to a Zetland event if you live in the Netherlands or Denmark. <laughs> no, I was gonna say, or, no, 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 I'm not. I, I consider a small part of the world, Netherlands or Denmark or Sweden, or, no, no, because I'm fully aware that Zetland is Danish, but, but, but one of the things that, that I've seen in common with the Netherlands is lots of events, and lots of, and lots of similar languages. Um, right, in French that's called rowing backwards. Um, so without further ado, to sort of talk a little bit about what this all means um, for our respective publications, but also what it means for journalism and for journalists in general, um, I will introduce the panel. So to my right, um, I have Louis Dreyfus, who is the CEO of Le Monde, which is the biggest distribution daily in France, is yeah. that right? Um, to his right is Florence Martin Kessler, who is the founder of Live Magazine, and she'll say more about what that is. And to Florence's right is Jacob Moll, who is the co-founder and CEO of Zitland, a Danish digital publication. Um, I will let each of them spend exactly and no more than five minutes saying a bit about what events means for their publication. Each of us has a couple of slides as well. It's always good to see events. Um, and then I'll ask one or two questions and then open it up to you guys. Um, so, Louis, do you want to tell us a bit about Le Monde and events? Yes. Um, hello, everybody. I will start. Uh, for Le Monde, a uh, few years ago, we decided to, to de develop a new format of events, uh, thinking that it was imp important for us to build a new relationship with our audience and to be able to recruit a new kind of readers. Um, it's, it's surprising as, um, um, at the same time that the information is becoming more digital and more virtual, we are seeing in France, but also everywhere in the world, um, a great appetite of the audience to have physical events and to be able to meet our um, editors. Um, that's the main categories of events we're organizing. The Mont Festival, the Club de l'Economie, a Smart Cities, um, one overtain about education, and the last one being uh, uh, Le Monde Afrique. To, be, to make it short, um, we are um, uh, organizing around 30 events a year with Le Monde. Uh, the, the three figures you are looking at are quite interesting. First one is our, we are, this audience is growing, meaning that we are developing new kind of audience every time we are organizing events. Those uh, people are, um, is our event about education, and they are telling us that we have a new way of discussing uh, what is orientation, what is education, and what is employment in France. It's a way for us to build new relationship with our future audience. And the last one, are the, um, the last figure I want to show you is the number of partners we find. Uh, it's a way for us to find a new source of revenues because Partners, uh, advertisers are looking for this event to do special events, and that's a way for us to better address their audience. The first one is Le Monde Festival. We created at the 70th anniversary of Le Monde after the New Yorker um, uh, Festival. 
that's what has been uh, organizing for 20 years, I believe. Uh, every year at um, Opera Garnier and Opera by Sea for three days, we are privatizing those two uh, locations and organizing 35 or 40 debates um, with guests invited by the um, editors of Le Monde. Uh, last year, we have more than 25,000 people paying for it, sponsors. It's a way for us to um, uh, put forward our editors, our main editors. We have been invited political uh, leaders, economic leaders, cultural leaders, philosophers, um, to, build, uh, to, um, to cross the looks on the society and on different teams. That's very efficient, and it's a way for us, obviously, and I think we'll talk about that later, to build a new kind of relationship with our subscribers. We have a business model with growing numbers of subscribers. It's a way for us to treat them and to offer them a new kind of relationship with the, the editors. The second um, um, kind of event is uh, the event towards the um, uh, economic leaders. So we are doing one about the um, business in France and international with every month uh, a top leader coming to discuss for, uh, for an hour with our editors. It's uh, um, um, open only to s selected numbers of people invited by our partners. It's uh, three hours later in our paper and on the digital. It's a way for us to give time to those people to better develop the strategy. It's very efficient for us, very efficient for them. It's a quite a win-win situation. The other one is uh, smart cities. Smart cities is for us a way for to be um, to to take a leadership position on one of the themes that um, seduce our readers, our editors, and our advertisers. So I'm organizing events in France and abroad every year in Singapore in mid-July, organizing um, top innovation prize uh, organized by Le Monde in English um, towards an uh, international audience. It's very efficient. It's a uh, uh, another, um, uh, another targets. The last target is for us to build a new relationship with our future audience. So education, it's one way to build it. Uh, it's c'est avant. Okay, so education we are getting in France, um, in Paris, and in um, different cities. Uh, seminars about education, but uh, moreover, and since I have only a few seconds left, I wanted to talk about Africa. We built a digital venture, Le Monde Afrique. We address uh, 7 million users every month and with conference in Dakar, in Abidjan, every year. For us, it's a way to, uh, to talk to a new audience, French-speaking audience. We, we invested in our auditors. We need to have a larger audience Obviously, Africa, it's our next target. And, uh, the, and, the, and the last one, um, it's uh, Le Monde Festival will be, and the first time we'll be doing that, we'll have a special edition in Quebec this year, in October. Uh, same time that we do in Africa, we think that Le Monde has to be the main French-speaking media, independent French-speaking media. We are very uh, strong in France, we must be better in the French-speaking countries abroad. Africa was a primary target. We have uh, now a venture, Le Monde Afrique. Now we are going to the North American audience with our partner Le Devoir in Quebec, and we'll be um, organizing a live event in October, Le Monde Festival Special Quebec Edition. That's a kind of, a, if I want to sum up, it's a way for us to address the audience, to um, monetize our editors, it's very gratifying for them, very gratifying for the partners, and the way for us to recruit new audience will be new readers and then new subscribers. That's for me. Thank you. Uh, hello. So um, I come from documentary filmmaking, and after uh, 15 years doing that, I was uh, uh, a Nimmen Fellow at Harvard. And so I got, uh, it got me inspired to, to change a bit and start a little, what started as a little experiment with journalism on stage and which now has uh, grown. So it's called Live Magazine and it's uh, reported stories on, uh, on stage. So I'm gonna show you a few pictures. 
So this is uh, the venue we have in Paris, which is 1,500 seaters. So that's before the show. So just I chose this picture because people don't go there as a conference. It's like a show, uh, a good time together. And uh, there is this kind of promise that they're going to, to be entertained with uh, great content. So, um, so we uh, sell out uh, all our events in advance. So this is uh, just uh, a few days ago. Usually there's uh, 15 speakers on, on stage. So here are a few, uh, a few details. So th it's reported stories told live. We do sometimes memoir, uh, but not very often. The stories are really short. Uh, we do have 12 stories with different uh, focus. Some are politics, international, uh, current affairs, uh, reportage. Some are sad, some are very funny. Uh, they are never told before, and they are reported and fact-checked. They are multimedia. We do have a lot of uh, sound, bites, or we try to try new things all the time. We can tell, we did uh, a story, actually a Le Monde story on, uh, with the WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp translated <coughs> what con WhatsApp conversation from a Syrian, Syrian migrant. Uh, we don't record, we don't, uh, have ad we don't uh, advertise in advance, and there is no theme uh, most of the time, so like a magazine. So people don't know what they're going to see. Uh, just a few facts. Uh, we are now doing it in 12 cities in Europe. Last year, we did 15 shows in different places. Uh, total audience is 20,000. Uh, we have uh, curated and produced tr more than 300 uh, stories, and we pay all uh, the contributors, which is uh, very important. We buy. I mean, they keep the rights for their stories, but we do uh, we do pay them. Uh, and now we have a little uh, enterprise doing that. We do uh, mostly uh, ticket sales, and we do pair with, that's a new thing for the past two years that we integrated with Louis, was to work with uh, legacy publishers. We've now worked with five of them. Uh, AFP, Le Monde, Les Echos, which is the financial journal in France, Bayard, which is a youth uh, media group, and Le Temps in Switzerland. And so we are making a profit. Voila. Uh, so I have learned a few things uh, doing that. Well, what I thought I would tell you about is that uh, it's a very small thing, obviously. Uh, but it kind of addresses a lot of the questions that uh, we're hearing in conference like uh, here. So, so I want to share those with you. I know, it's a little long, but... Uh, one minute. Huh? One minute. So I'll just say that uh, people have, uh, uh, you know, they crave to, uh, to, be, unt to be embarked with uh, stories that are powerful, so they will give us their full attention. We don't, I've never seen anybody, uh, you know, pull out their phones in the audience. So they are really with us for this 100 minute times. Uh, they like, uh, they are very um, happy to have those handmade, very high quality stories. Uh, we touch a lot of people, very young kids. We have a program for kids from the banlieue. They are very happy with that. And we know for a fact that they don't consume any journalism whatsoever. We have an elderly, more conservative audience that comes, so we have reached out from our initial audience of hipsters. Uh, we know very well our members. We've, tr we've started a kind of a membership program that's worked uh, beyond our expectations. People buy like a yearly subscription, but they don't even know many shows there will be or at what dates or what will be in it. Uh, what else? Uh, people... Um, what else? I just have one minute. Yeah, just one thing. We've worked with several newsrooms, as I was saying, and that has proved uh, very, um, very good in terms of uh, human relations, I guess, for the newsroom. People are very happy to do it, and so I have kind of this free reign uh, to go and pick and choose in a, a, a newsroom of hundreds of journalists and try to find stories that will kind of reflect the overall newspaper. That's very energizing for the newsroom. People really love doing this. 
Uh, and uh, voila, and then the last thing we we do mix up with a lot of different things that are away from journalism and we try to get, you know, artists, performance. Last time, last month we did a journalism with Shadow Theater, which was great. So we really try to push the boundary with dance and uh, people love this element of surprise. And just one last thing, we had the Prime Minister of France who came to say a story on stage the other day that he has never told and that was kind of a coup and that got us a lot of good publicity. Thank you. Thank you. Jacob. <coughs> so, um, to understand what we're doing with Setland Live, you have to maybe have an idea of, um, of, of what Setland is, uh, because we're less well known than Le Monde, for instance. Uh, so, so as, as Rene said, we, we are a membership-based, well, we're a digital newspaper that's membership-based, uh, that, uh, sl that, that does slow news, slow, slow news, you can say. Um, and what I want to, to talk about is, is how our newspaper business relates to the events that we're doing, because I think that's probably most, the most interesting question also from a, from a business point of view. So what we do, um, we, we publish in different formats and consider what we do as service to our members. So, so we, we solve a, a, a problem in, in, in you know, feeling a relationship to current affairs and, and feeling um, connected to the times we live in. And, and we do that in different ways. We publish uh, two to three daily feature articles. Uh, everything we publish is also published in audio which is a different story, but it's, it's, it's a way of connecting uh, with, uh, with our members that has a relationship, I think, to, to live events. Um, we publish on a custom design platform that was recently named the best designed news site uh, in, in the Nordic countries, where design is a very big thing. And then we send a news brief every afternoon that's also done on, on audio. And then we, we, we work with member involvement and, and transparency. Um, and then we do large-scale events. So let me talk about those. Um, the concept is, is quite similar to what um, Blanche just described. It turned out that we were working in Copenhagen and had been for, for, for quite a few years with, with the same thoughts and some of the same uh, tricks and formats as Florence ended up doing in uh, Paris without us being in contact, which was actually quite interesting because we were doing so many, or, you know, coming to so many of the same conclusions. Uh, independently, which is, I think, is interesting. Incroyable. <laughs> um, so, uh, so what we do is like uh, 80 to 90 minute shows. We do 12 to 14 stories, and um, we uh, we've been doing it for um, for many years. And and early on, we began selling out uh, the largest venues in Copenhagen. This is a picture from uh, from this fall in the Royal uh, Theatre. It is sold out. The three empty seats are for the Queen, <laughs> and she wasn't there that day. Um, and what goes on on stage? We, we, when we call it live journalism, it's, it's, it's more than uh, events like these, of course, which I would not consider live journalism. Um, this, uh, we, we are heavily influenced by theatre, uh, both in our process and, and in the tricks we use. So, so we, we, we think, think in terms of, of directing and using the whole stage and using all of the uh, all, all possibilities in the in the stage you know, space and the, in the room again similar to, to live magazine in, in, in Paris uh, it's me on the right telling a story about the history and science of applause who begin who you know when, when you start clapping there's always some people that create that and there's some interest in science behind that so I I told that story in the audience with the audience performing uh, uh, different types of, of, of applause and, and telling them how it spreads and everything. We almost always have, um, have, have like many elements of, of the audience being involved in telling the story, which is again something that, that creates a very different space because the we of the show is not what's going on on stage, it is what's going on in the, in the, in the, in the whole room. And, and I think that's uh, a very powerful thing um, in term, uh, term of, of, of events. Um, in the bottom right, there's a jazz guitarist that's, uh, that's playing speeches by Obama and Donald Trump and, and you know, showing how the, the, the means of communications are very, very different and, and showing that with jazz music in a very uh, emotional way. And in the bottom right, my co-founder Silke is, is, is doing like, like one of the after shows we do. We, we think in terms of the event is, is, is not the 19 minutes. It begins 
before the event, event when you buy the ticket and, and when you arrive. And, uh, and this, afterwards, we always try to, to, to do what we call section two, like in a newspaper, um, where you can meet and the conversation is, is directed and continues afterwards. Yes. So uh, just a few uh, points. We are proud to be like the first large-scale live journalism shows in Europe because we, we started doing it in, in 2013. Uh, the most interesting, important point is really uh, that, that we can see that these shows create what I call extreme engagement. We get people to, to cry and laugh and, and, and leave the theater feeling a, a deep connection to, to what they just experienced, the stories they heard and, and the, the community they were felt involved with. Um, we do not have great profi uh, profitability, profitability on, the, uh, on the shows themselves. Um, and we have had challenges getting people to sign up directly uh, to, to memberships uh, at the shows. Um, but it's, that has never been a problem because the strategic value is, 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 is very high. And what I mean by that is that um, we're an investor-funded uh, funded, uh, business. And, and we could never have connected with, with the people that end up f uh, funding us and, and, um, uh, and that keep funding us in, in this period of time without, without live journalism. That, that's where we connected with these people and it's the same thing goes with, with partners and, and our own staff and ourselves and it's, it's really what, it's, it's the fuel that keeps the whole, you know, everything going. Uh, it's a differentiator for us as a brand. As, you know, no, no, nobody else in Denmark can do uh, what we do with live journalism. Uh, they, they don't come near. And that's, that's, uh, that's important in, in, in getting attention to, to the whole project of Zetland. Uh, it creates ambassadors for us um, in, in, um, in like d uh, engaging members. It's, and and, and, and that's, that's very important for our model because we, uh, we, we need members to, to refer other people to, to Zetland. And finally, um, two learnings. Uh, we've have ch had challenges to, to, uh, to measure impact. And um, we, we need to be able to measure the engagement that we're creating and where it's directed. And that's the next point, is that, that we can see that we, we are creating this extreme engagement. And I think that what we need to develop, the format is pretty much perfect, I think, with what we're wor working with and has many opportunities to develop. Our challenge is to take this, this extreme engagement and direct it towards something that, that has, you know, that where we actually use that value. In, in getting the ambassadors that we create in the room to, to go out into world, to the world and, and help us succeed. And that's still something we're figuring out um, exactly how to do. Great, thank you. And quickly, coming back to a traditional media, um, I'll tell you a tiny bit about the FT events. Um, and it's interesting because I think you, we started with Le Monde, which is a traditional legacy publisher, and finishing with the Financial Times, with two less, less traditional event series. Um, and we launched this about a year and a half ago precisely as a non-traditional event series, although it's, you know, our series of events is a panel discussions. It looks and feels a lot like this. But we realized with the Financial Times that we had a real perception problem. People think it's about finance and business and economics and that they think, for the most part, it's not for them. And so actually inspired to some extent by what we saw were successes of others, you know, sometimes other people's success is just as good to copy, by the live event strategies that we saw being developed in the more digital startups, we wanted to find a way to expose people who wouldn't necessarily read the Financial Times, who wouldn't necessarily think it was for them, to the idea that actually our content and our brand and the experience maybe could be relevant for them. So we basically thought, well, how do we get people to come in to the FT? People are always interested in newsrooms. There's kind of a fascination around getting people into the actual place and then getting them to like have a drink and engage. And there's often also, we thought, maybe a certain kind of appeal and an attraction to getting proximity to journalists, to actually having some sense of, of who they are and meeting them. Um, so we started off with kind of one once a month. We thought, well, how do we bring in people, get them to engage with either the best of our journalists or the best of our stories or stories that weren't typical of FT and have a conversation, have a drink and see what this would do in terms of either engaging our subscribers who are already kind of engaged but then this was to some extent a bit more of a perk, almost like a membership concept or again to, to begin to spark a conversation with people who wouldn't necessarily think the FT was relevant for them. 
So we started off, our very first event was actually about something that nobody had any idea that the FD covered, and that's football. Um, and this is actually just a bunch of our events. So again, it's just once a month, so it's modest. It's pretty small, it's about 100 people a shot. They come into the Financial Times. Um, we've done them all in London and only one abroad. And it's, um, it's pretty traditional, but they've all sold out. And we do, we've really done an effort in trying to making the spectrum of topics as broad as possible. So we've done football, we've done machines and automation, we've done foreign policy, we've done gender pay gap, uh, investing. So the range of subjects from the traditional subjects you might imagine the FT would cover, and like foreign policy and investing, to things that are a bit less traditional, um, like, um, well, these are all kind of traditional, aren't they? Um, but I swear we've done one on football, and we've also done one on the air pollution's killing you, and we've also done one on um, um, should young people kill the old ones and take over, um, where we had our millennials, <laughs> we did, we had our millennials against our, their parents, because both of that age range works in the, in the newsroom. And interestingly, the ones that have sold out the most and brought in the most young people were sport and, um, and investing. Um, but we did an investing for millennials, which was actually our probably most successful one to date. So that's an example of the topics. And, but we are the Financial Times, and we like to measure things. And this speaks to what Jacob was just saying. For us, it was an experiment, but it was an experiment that was only going to be worth the kind of an, a, a measurable sense of what it was doing, either to bring in new people or engage the old ones. And so we did measure it, and we saw that actually um, we have this metric called RFV. It's a combination, it's our, what we call our engagement metric, and it's a combination of how often people come back and to the website and how much content they read when they come back. And we found, this was just with our subscribers, we, we weren't obviously able to measure this with new readers, but with the subscribers who were coming to our events, we were actually able to measure that those who came, um, if they hadn't come, that was the blue line. They were on a sort of downward engagement slope, which is kind of typical. Over time, people become less engaged. But those who came to an event actually then had a 300% increase in their engagement score. Now, we can't say that it was a cause and effect, but we can sort of deduce that actually the fact of coming to an event did make them more engaged with the content. So we've decided to carry on. That was essentially the metric after a year. We're carrying on with it. We're still doing one a month. Um, we're making money, but we're breaking even because the objective of these events is not to make money. It's not financial. And I'll come back to that actually a little bit with Louis because there is a real revenue objective which can be possible. For us, that's not the objective here. And so we're just breaking even. Um, and lastly, if you want to think about where we can go next, well, what can we do with events? If they're working for us and they're engaging readers and they're bringing in new readers, do we want to begin to think about making money? Or do we want to think about selling subscriptions via these events? How else can we use them? And these are a couple of things, but I won't go into the detail because I want to get to the question aspect. Um, so all of us have sort of exposed different event strategies. Um, and I kind of wanted to actually come back to, to Louis. Um, you know, to some extent, Le Mans strategy is probably the most eclectic of the ones we've presented because it ranges from the kind of bigger corporate events that do make money to the more kind of engagement events. And I know that you and Florence work together to produce specifically a live journalism event, which is quite different from this traditional sort of, you know, bring experts together and have a Q&A. Why initially did you decide to work with Florence to produce that kind of unconventional event? What was the objective for Le Monde? Um, the story was, I, I went to one of the first events um, Florence organized in Paris, I think it was the second one, because of a few friends on, um, on stage doing it. And uh, it was at the time we were thinking of the second edition of the Moon Festival. And I thought it would be a fantastic idea mm -hmm. for our reader who are coming to the Moon Festival at the end, at the closing of this uh, three-day event, to have uh, an event dedicated to journalism and to put on stage one of the best talents we have in Le Monde, since we are, for the past 70 years, we are focused on developing uh, the journalists and talents and promoting them. The rest, the rest and the business model um, are there only to help the grow uh, talent and independent journalism. Mm -hmm. And um, Florence uh, managed to develop uh, a format was promoting journalism and having also um, a fun aspect, which is what was and still is not exactly on the DNA of Le Monde, 
And if I want to recruit new readers, I need to um, show to the readers or to the public that we could be fun, we could be fascinating, and we are, we are not only serious mm -hmm. and experts. And I thought that uh, Florence could be uh, great to help us organize a closing ceremony of the Le Monde Festival. So it uh, integrated this part to uh, an event already organized. And similarly then, sort of on, on the live journalism front, um, so this was a not an innovation to some extent for Le Monde. You'd never done something like this before with quite a different objective. Coming to you on the same type of event, Jacob, it seems like you guys actually seem to have conceived of events almost as part of the strategy when you launched Zetland, or, or, or how did it come about? Was it part of your initial concept of what Zitland was going to be about? Definitely. Um, uh, the thought was we, did, we, we knew we wanted to work with digital journalism, and one of our first, first thoughts was that there is, there is a problem of digital journalism, which is, which is the, the, the tactile you know, feeling of, of a newspaper. It's, it's actually part of the meaning of, of having it in your home and, 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 and sharing it and feeling it. So we thought that that we, we should do we should try to do the opposite at the same time to be as analog and as emotional as we could, and and that was one of the first things we we thought up. And at the and to begin with, we we simply did it for fun. Basically, uh, we heard about what's called Pop Up Magazine in California. We'd never seen it. We just like spoke to one of the people behind it, and then just like filled out the blanks in our heads, and it like it it immediately took off. So so we we in that people. And pe people loved it, and and at the time we were publishing e-singles, very lo very long, serious journalism in, in ebook format, and people didn't care about that at all. <laughs> they just, they just wanted the live shows. Um, so 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 that's that's where it came from, and then then you know we we just figured out afterwards. Then you know we we could we could feel the power of it, and then we just like spent a lot of time trying to figure out what to do with that. And I also, we, we've done we've actually done done a lot of commercial events as well. And I think there's a great business opportunity in, in, in doing that. We just, we maybe haven't been smart enough to make an organization that, that feels that it can do both. Um, yeah. And I would like to come back probably actually with you and Louis to the idea of well, how, what is the measurable impact of these? How, how does it work in a, bigger, in a bigger strategy, whether it's an editorial journalism strategy or a business strategy? But, but before that, just a, a question for you, Florence. So, you know, you, had, you were a traditional journalist producing pretty traditional documentaries. And now you're producing this what you consider journalism, or, or don't you? Are live events like this, is it journalism? I mean, if you ask the, the French uh, commission that decide what is journalism and what is not, we are not journalism, obviously. But, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, it is journalism, and uh, we like to, um, it is journalism, and especially because we, there are some formats that emphasize memoir and uh, first-person stories, and this, sometimes we've tried doing some, uh, these kind of podcasty uh, first-person narratives, and people in the audience, usually they don't like it. They say, this is, this is crap. We want to, because I guess the reporting, the fact that you are talking about people who you, you've decided to, uh, you know, to, to spend maybe a year reporting on or following, there is something very touching, and the public is very uh, interested in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's, it's the same reporting, the same very, uh, you know, we do edit every story uh, as I, I, I'm turned into more, maybe a half of an editor and maybe as a commissioning editor in the traditional, you know, television world. Mm -hmm. Choosing, the, it's very important, uh, Jacob knows it, to, to balance out the different uh, stories. Both of you, both you and Jacob talk about um, some analog and power and and actually the live events I think aren't streamed they're not recorded what's why do we need that why is this important I think people like to sit together and share something they like to have a party after where they did talk together uh, what they prefer they they love to have the the promise of something they they, they want to be uh, surprised they want, and they always want us to keep up on our promise that you're going to hear stories you're never hear anywhere. They are 100% true, and the people coming on stage are not professionals. They're not. They have nothing to gain doing that except, you know, it's very stressful for the journalists. Mm -hmm. But they they were very happy. It, it, they, you know, one of uh, your uh, one of your investigation star decided to do a very intimate story that we liked or not, but he wrote me that it's the best thing he's done in his life. It was really uh, something. 
Actually, maybe I can ask Louis a follow-up question about that. So the events that all of us are talking about, these kind of reader engagement events, are really about putting the journalism forward, right? And putting the journalists forward. You know, Louis, you run Le Monde. Is this, are events a good use of your journalists' time? Should they be doing events? It's a, uh, yeah, it's a very good use of uh, journalism, and they are ve very happy to do that. Um, at a time when uh, um, information is often anonymous through um, the GAFA, uh, at a time when uh, they had the feeling that their business model of the company was, um, was uh, threatened, at a time when they see the audience decreasing, to see that people were ready to pay to listen to the story and were coming to see them, it's very gratifying. And in Le Monde, we are trying to promote our signature. So it's a way for me to tell my audience, Le Monde is not like anybody else. We have talents. We have put them on stage. They are going to, they are going to tell you about journalism. They are going to uh, animate debate. We, we want to be a moderator of the main issue in our society. That's a way for me. To, um, to promote uh, my, journal my journalist uh, over the seven, last seven years, I, my editorial staff grew from 300 to 430 journalists at Le Monde. We increased by 30% the number of journalists. That's something that we invested in. But for, to, to make a business model of it, I need to uh, find a new format for them to express their talents. Mm -hmm. um, live journalism, uh, live debate is obviously one of the new of them. It's, uh, we have a business model of that. It's uh, highly profitable. So you're making money from the We events. are making money. We're recruiting new audience. It's a way for us to talk to a younger audience, to talk to, to a foreign audience. And we're making money because we are, pro we are offering new kind of format to our advertisers. So let me, la final question before I hand it over to you guys, um, probably for both Jacob and Louis. So it, it is, it's the money question, right? So, you know, it's, pretty clear this is good for engagement. Um, it sounds like all of us produce events that, that more or less sell out or, or bring in audiences. The challenge with events, though, is that unlike digital content, it's not very scalable, right? And it takes time, it takes money. I mean, Jacob, are, are you guys making money? Is that not the objective? Do you need to, do you need to be making money? Is it sustainable? I, c I, could, I could get, I can get back to the, like, the actual financials of it, but, but I think there is all this value that we're talking about right now in, in that we're talking about trust as like a basic challenge for journalism right now. And there is, there is noth nothing as incredible as, as looking the people, you know, actually journalists and, and the, audience, the audience being together. And that actually goes, goes both ways because, because it's, it's gratifying, as Louis said, uh, for, for, the, for the reporters. Uh, just to have the experience of being able to do that and be like a little bit like a rock star on a stage. Also, they get to see the audience in the eye. They get to see the people, and that's something that's that's not a, a, you know part of everyday uh, life in journalism. It can they can feel really far away. So that's gratifying, but it's also a question of you know retention and recruitment and all these things. But but definitely these shows are quite expensive to make. Um, so so um, so yeah, that that is a challenge. And I think uh, we're, we're still, it sounds like uh, with the whole sponsor, sponsor thing, there, there are some models that definitely work. And I think, uh, I think this can, be, it can go, go in many directions. Uh, and, and many of them can be profitable and, and like, like strengthen the core of, of, of businesses, um, yeah. as you described with your, your engagement metrics. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to hand it over to you guys. Um, and I may come back maybe for a final question to each of you. Um, but are there questions in the audience? Um, great, I'll start maybe here, and then there, and then there. Is there a microphone? Great, could we start over here? Thank you. Hi, thanks for a really interesting panel. Dennis Redmond, I teach uh, international media here at the Graduate School of Journalism in Perugia and uh, other projects. Uh, can you give us, if it's not too secret, uh, a verbal pie chart of your revenue, Louis, mostly. Uh, you know, is it is it admission? Is it sponsors? It is other, more or less, and maybe the others. And the second thing, are you not eating the lunch of TEDx? And what is, wh how, how is that relating to, is there room for everyone? Or what's the trend there? 
we're getting uh, a lot of micro events, et cetera, and everyone wants to have the experiential feeling when you go there, et cetera, you take it home, you have the food, you, you, you bond with people, and then you go to another one and it's a look-alike. Uh, I don't know if there is a room for everyone, but I think there is a room for Le Monde. Do I take money from somebody else? That's a possibility. It's not my main concern, to be honest. Uh, we are, uh, the revenues are 90% from sponsorship and only 10% of admission. Only uh, admission is there only for people to book the tickets and to make sure that we won't have em empty rooms. But uh, when you have, um, at Le Monde, we are organize that every year for Le Monde Festival, the day all the public monuments are open for free. And to have those days, 25,000 people paying five euros for every debate, it's quite a performance. It doesn't switch, it doesn't change the business model because it's highly um, paid by sponsors, but it's a good way to make sure that the audience is coming for good reason. So we, so we are mostly uh, ticket sales. Our, our ticket sales from 10 euros to 45 euros. Uh, and we do have sponsors as well. Yes, exactly. Because it's huge halls, so obviously if you're in the back, it's not as great. And uh, we also get bought by uh, festivals, towns, uh, uh, you know, cultural. Like this summer, we're going to three big festivals. So we do th uh, thematic things. We're going to Arles, where we're going to the opening in the Antique Theatre. So this is a mix of sponsors, uh, the festival buying it for a fee and ticket sales. It's a huge hall, uh, 2,500 people. Uh, what else? Yeah, and we have sponsors. We have a sponsorship with uh, Agence France Presse. Like, so every, every year we do five stories with their reporters, so, uh, and, they, and they pay for that. Uh, and we have a, a new kind of revenue stream. We, we do sometime, last year we did three uh, shows, private shows for brands. So we do put uh, freelance reporters. Uh, it's, it's kind of, a, they get tired of conferences. They want a more, uh, as you say, uh, emotional, <laughs> brilliant stories. And it's also a way for us to kind of reach new people, you know, because people maybe that wouldn't go to our shows. And we do have su subsidies from the government, which is new, and, and it is for, uh, for the media literacy program that we do. Every show we have 10% of, uh, uh, you know, teenagers. And then they choose a journalist that who go to their class uh, media literacy is a uh, is a priority of the government, and so it's a good way for for them. Countries that still subsidize culture. <laughs> voilà. um, next question. Hi, my name is Richard, and I'm responsible for events at Republic, so in Switzerland. And uh, so I'm interested a bit more in the practical side. You said before that some journalists are. You said that they feel like rock stars, but you also said that, Florence, I think you, that they're not professionals. So how do you actually support uh, journalists uh, to be fit for the stage? And what kind of, you work with theater, use tricks from the theater, so I'd be interested in hearing a bit more about that. Do you rehearse, for example, and stuff? It's, of course, it's, but there's a part of it that, that will not be for everyone, but actually almost everyone. Pe people, it turns out that people that are, that are good storytellers in writing or in, in other journalistic formats can actually typically be helped to be great st stage performers. So, so we've had help from actors and we've developed, you know, you know, we, know we know all the mistakes people make uh, and we can help them. We've turned into like semi-professional uh, directors of, of journalists performing on stage. So, so it's 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 practice. We do we do events of very in, in very different uh, in, in different scales. We also do uh, 100, 200 people, and sometimes we do them in, in our in our own newsroom, which has a which has an attraction. Uh, so, so maybe our reporters will, will do these smaller things for one, two, three times, and they'll 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 get the feel of it, and and then they can move to the big stage. And, but at the same time, you know, it, it, it it's really not a goal for it to be uh, to, to to be to be perfect. It's 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 very important. I think that's it's 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 a weakness of some of the I think some of the American great live shows uh, that they feel almost 
like like televisiony, you know, like like it's everybody knows what what's what's going on. It needs to have uh, like a humane feel. I know that's important for you guys as well. Yeah, just to finish on the TED and the, there is a, f a very um, people, you know, we prepare them, but pe but it's very uh, people feel very fragile and a little bit vulnerable, and it's very imperfect. I mean it. It's not like uh, people are not moving across the stage like rock stars. Some are terrified and and clinging to their, uh, you know, papers. Some read. Uh, it's not about eloquence. It's not like, but um, and so we don't. We try to to keep this diversity of voices and of uh, emotions. But we are not throwing people uh, like that. And yeah, usually they are very. They, usually they always tell me, and I always have a textos that they want to cancel the night before and they always <laughs> <laughs> went told me what can what will you accept uh, you know i'm uh, you know leaving for jihad to syria <laughs> uh, my father died <laughs> um and it happened a lot and we tell them but you cannot fail people are going to be very nice to you and usually they don't regret doing it at all i don't think out of the 300 plus people and some are a little more weak, and some are a little more, you know, arrogant. And so this all kind of humanity. And people told me the other day, it's funny, we don't even know what we're going to see. Uh, we opened the program, there's little bios that I write kind of carefully about each and every one. And after those five minutes, uh, we, we feel like we know those people. So there is something that's kind of uh, fast uh, bonding, and I don't think you get that into TED, also because those people are not experts. They are not selling, you know, they are not on the conference circuit, and we make sure that we don't pick up those people. I always try not to pick people who have a book to sell or things like that. So it's kind of fresh. They, they are just here for the, you know, the love of journalism. And the money we pay them a little bit. <laughs> Hi, Jim Lauterbach. I run a traditional events business about online video called VidCon. Um, really, really inspiring. You guys are doing great stuff. Super cool to see. Uh, question actually for you, Renee. I mean, FT has probably, what, millions of subscribers? How do you justify a business where you're only touching 100 people at a time when, you have, when you're mass media? So that's a really good question. We don't yet have a million, but we're getting there. <laughs> um, but close. We do have 925,000 subscribers. And in reality, I actually only described a portion of our event strategy. So in fact, you know, Louis described the sort of more engagement events, and then you do have sort of the more corporate events that make money. The Financial Times does also have a corporate events business. It's a separate P&L, and it makes a lot of money. And it's a very different kind of event, right? It looks and feels a bit more like a traditional conference. Usually it's corporate, you know, it's corporates paying thousands of pounds for a ticket for their employees. It's got a, an entirely different objective, and that does reach thousands, and it's global. Um, and it's not so much editorially driven, though. It's not about the audience. It's not about the readers. It's not so much about the journalism as it is about the revenue. So the objective for us here isn't to make money. It's just to not lose any. Um, but the objective is, however, really about the audience and about creating a different experience with the Financial Times and collaterally and also at the at the end of the funnel somewhere, it, it, it will translate into some kind of measurable revenue if the subscribers who come stay longer and renew. If the people who had never thought of buying the FT suddenly thought, well, actually, I had no idea they did stories like that, or that journalist that I saw on stage is really interesting. I think I might want to subscribe to read them. Then somewhere along the way, you'll have, you'll have participated to the tipping point, the thing that converted them. Um, we're never going to be perfectly able to correlate the cause and effect, but that's the theory. And, and so far, with, with a kind of uptick in engagement, that's how we kind of rationalize a smaller audience, precisely because that's part of the engagement experience. Jacob, yeah. And, and also, there's, there's a possibility of, of, of thinking video uh, in, into this. Uh, you, you should never try to, I'm sorry, to, to do this. <laughs> to, to, this is not going to be a great video of a, of a it's, it's, you know, it's, that, that's not how it works. But but you can but but you can take the stories that work on stage, and 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 work with them and present them in video versions, it's all to the camera, and um, and 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 some of the tricks of storytelling and can be quite similar to to some of the explainer formats or the yeah well the, the storytelling that really works, and and we are still trying to build that because we can also not afford to be seen as something that's going on in Copenhagen even though Denmark is a small country. Uh, we, we need to, to f members in the other end of the country need to feel that this is, they're, they're part of the we as well. So I think using video at, a, at, a, at an event, thinking that into the event can, can, can solve 
that very, very relevant problem you described. And, and one, last, uh, one last thing, um, if you compare with Todex, um, don't, uh, don't forget that when we have uh, legacy media supporting those kind of events, we have uh, strengths that Todex doesn't have. We can promote it uh, beforehand, and we can promote it after, and we can publish, we can republish, and uh, when we see, let, let's say, the Mont Festival, we have 25,000 people uh, in the audience, in physical audience, but we'll reach a million and 500,000 before, and more than two million be after that through a digital venture or through a newspaper. So it's uh, for uh, audience, for journalists, and for partners, it's a huge difference in terms of scalability. And it, it, yeah. it is also true that actually I think increasingly I'm certainly seeing among peers, um, other media people who are producing events that content is being produced out of it, right? Podcasts or video. Um, you know, we haven't actually yet started doing that at the Financial Times because that actually is a layer of production and of resource and of money that we haven't yet invested. But certainly that's one way of making the events more scalable. And it sounds like you guys are already doing that to some extent. Was there another question back there? I hear um, that you actually are man managed to attract y younger audience with some of your formats. This is with, with your uh, events. Uh, I don't hear that a lot. I work in a region where youth is absolutely not interested in news, doesn't follow it at all. They're not interested in journalism. So I would like to hear what are the tips or any kind of learnings that you have from attracting how do you do that? So we do three things for, di for three different age groups. We do a, ch a children's show, uh, 7 to 12, with journalism by and for children, with authors you know, from the youth sector, and so which is traditionally a fiction uh, world. We try to do journalism. We do that with, uh, with a very famous uh, group uh, called Bayard Press, and they have two very famous things, called one called Jemlia for this younger kids and another one called Astrapi where I think they have for Germany two million subscribers every single little child a lot of children read that uh, and so it's been a success we're redoing uh, it next year it, it's in Paris it's not a huge audience we do the program I talked about the media literacy one uh, those are for uh, young people from a bad neighborhood uh, who don't consume any journalism they have never so for them it's like a first uh, contact. They are they love it. We have an excellent response with teenagers. They don't even imagine before that uh, story. They could be uh, fascinated by stories that are actually true. And then after that, bang bang bang, we explain what's a fact, what's a rumor, what's uh, how do you t what's an information. And so it's a small program. Uh, I think we're gonna do. We did uh, a thousand this year, and we're going to four hundred, four thousand next year because we got grants. So that's going to be a little industry. And then we do uh, workshops for uh, eighteen to twenty-five. So we, so this is I I in journalism school, and we're going to do it in uh, with social centers. We uh, use, uh, you know, uh, storytelling and uh, you know to talk in public at the which are two tools to uh, you know to teach them about uh, journalism as well through like a 40 hours a, a one week uh, workshop uh, and that has been working really well and the best kids usually we do this with 70 uh, young, young at one time the the best stories we put on our regular show so this is really uh, something is that answer your question Time for one last question, and then a quick lightning round of um, what you have coming up. Each of you has coming up next in terms of events. Last question. Uh, yes, uh, specifically for Jacob and uh, um, Florence. Um, what what kind of stories do you think work best in in your branch of live journalism? What 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 are the stories that are uh, really well received, and what doesn't work? I think Florence used the, the phrase that you talked about balance. I think one of the parts of what makes it uh, work well is, is if, if as you within the same show work with something that's light and, and funny and something that's that's deep and, and emotional and something that's visual and something that's that's only uh, opera or whatever. 
Um, so, so it can be many things. I think the, the most the fun part is to uh, is, is to to make compelling stories out of really serious issues, and and um, and that's I think. And those are also the st often the stories that people remember. Um, we had like like we had a we we we, um, we had this young politician who went to fight in uh, in, in Syria with uh, on 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 the Kurd Kurdish side. Um, so so like telling his story, the live live story, and and then we used the trick to actually tell the story with like his uh, mobile phone videos from Syria before we introduced him to the stage, which is like a cheap trick, but but uh, it's like a reveal. So so now you meet him today, and here he is, and he's, now he can answer relevant questions. Um, so so those stories. Are the best. Uh, biggest problem actually is interviews. Uh, they're very hard to to do right because they 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 need to be very prepared, and if they are very prepared, they will feel uh, mechanical. So so they actually work best when they fail, when something unexpected happens, so people have a blackout or it goes goes off in some direction. Uh, so 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 actually we're we're really toning down down the interview format, and I think you don't even do them. Um, it's hard to predict what will work. I mean, we have some um, idea beforehand, but then uh, sometime, uh, you know, a story that you thought was kind of average will suddenly, uh, you know, jazz up the whole room. It's very uh, unexpected, and that's the beauty of it. It's a bit like work. There is something a bit suspended that, you know, you don't know what's going to happen, you know. So that that is the truth. Yeah, we do our... But we know that we push every story to the max to where it could go. Some, yeah. Sometimes we make mistakes too, and people uh, are not nice when we do. <laughs> Actually, you know what? We're almost at the end. Um, that will be the last question. Thank you. And maybe I can ask each of the panelists what either either what you have coming next, or or, or what advice would be for people who, who want to go down the events route. Louis, uh, what we have next? We have um, a smart cities event in Singapore early July. We have. Uh, we just took over um, a festival of journalism in France at uh, Couture next to Bordeaux that will be adding um, around Bastille days from 13th of July to 15th of July. And then we have Le Monde Festival in uh, late September in Paris and then uh, early October in, um, in Quebec. So that's uh, give you a good range of um, activities we have. I think the next step for us is try to develop live events around M, the Magazine du Monde, which is a weekend magazine we created uh, six years ago, which, which is highly successful, and I'm sure we could do even probably like the one the New York Times organizing around T. And uh, so we are working on the internship, with the internship of M to develop live events with that. Great, thank you. Florence. No, you only first. Ah, so we, um, as you can, the events that we've done so far have very much been around a journalist or around a topic. So up next for us is doing events around newsletters um, and trying to actually merge engagement strategies or sort of diversify those brands. So stay tuned. <laughs> Florence. Uh, our next events, so one was last night, so that's finished. Uh, one is in uh, Brussels, May 3rd, in English, uh, at 5 o'clock at Bazaar. Uh, one is uh, the kid event, June 10, then we have the Arl, uh, Arl's uh, Photography Festival, July 5th, then we, I mean, then we have a uh, the photojournalism special in Perpignan. We're doing the closing night on the Saturday. And then we are going to uh, Manosque, a small town in the south of France, for a literature special with writers, novelists telling uh, true stories. Uh, we're going to do a very large show in, in, uh, in, in a Danish island called Bonholm, uh, where there's this Scandinavian, uh, quite young tradition to, to bring uh, politicians and people and make what they call like a people's conference with maybe 30, 40, 50,000 people gathering. And, and at the big stage, we're doing a, a show. Um, and the challenge, I think, for us is, is that, that people, people that get a great experience with our shows should also uh, get 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 an idea of what what else we're doing and what our mission is. So we can do like really great standalone crazy shows, but but they really have no you know they're nothing more than entertainment for us from a business point of view. If people don't feel a connection to to the journalistic mission that we that we do, so, so so trying to make sure that the stories we tell uh, are connected to our journalistic mission and 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 there's like a natural next step 
in right. bringing people closer to us. That's is, like uh, excellent parting summary of probably what a good yeah. engagement strategy is. Good luck. Yeah. Thank you very much. Please congratulate our panelists.